So let's get started. So aeroids is what we're going to be talking about. So, you know, kind of a, a, a new kind of a term that is kind of floating around out there. Um, aeroids are a huge group of plants. Um, so aeroids, what are aeroids? Well, they're part of the uh, Aerosi uh, family, which I probably butchered that name. I'm horrible at uh, pronouncing some of these Latin names, um, but also known as the Arum family. But aeroids is a great way to kind of group that entire group together. Um, in that family, there's a ton of different species. I mean, over 3,300, 3,500, I think is what I saw. So there are more than enough of these aeroids out there. And they grow on every continent in the world, except for Antarctica. So they're found everywhere in all different types of climates. Most of what we're going to be talking about today are indoor plants. However, there are some that can be grown outside, um, and we'll be talking about those as well. Not as huge a selection in our colder climates. Most of these plants are going to like a little bit more of a tropical uh, environment, so that's why they make great indoor houseplants. Uh, but houseplants are becoming so, so popular, and aeroids are part of that big group that make up a lot of, of indoor plants. And the, one of the reasons that they're so easy to grow um, is kind of in the name, aeroids. It's, it's kind of an air, the, the, the plant or the root system is very, very tough and durable. Um, and so that's kind of one of the, the special features of an aeroid. Um, so I'm going to name some of the plants here that we're going to be talking about. Um, and, and you'll probably recognize a lot of these names because uh, they're very common indoor plants. So aglaonemias, uh, philodendrons, pothos, as Michelle mentioned, um, and then anthuriums. Uh, we've got philodendrons. I think I mentioned that one. Uh, let's see, ZZ plant, one of the easiest plants of all time to grow. Um, Diffenbachia, uh, peace lilies, a very common uh, indoor plant. Um, and then even elephant ears or alocasia or calocasia. Uh, so there's a lots and lots of different varieties and lots and lots of different species. And so uh, we're going to be talking about some of them that we have right now. Uh, the reason that these plants are so tough and durable um, is they have a lot of special abilities. Um, a lot of these plants were started actually growing in water. Uh, anthuriums, I'm sure a lot of you probably remember back in the day, uh, anthuriums were grown uh, in water exclusively with, you know, a fish growing or a fish uh, in a fish tank or living, uh, the, the fish living underneath in a bowl of water. Um, and so, you know, kind of the, these things that are coming back uh, to fruition here. Um, but uh, th they were kind of grown in swamps. I mean, that's kind of what their home uh, was, was, was growing in water. So they developed a very durable root system because, and leaf structure as well. Uh, most, of them are, most of them are thick, leathery leaves, uh, which help kind of repel some moisture if needed. Um, and also the root system. So I'll bring this big plant down here in a second, but this is an aeroid root right here, hanging from this huge plant above me. I'll show you in a minute. You can see all these roots coming down in the background, but it's a very thick, durable root. I mean, this thing almost looks like a stem on a branch, but this can take moisture out of the air as well as sitting on soil. It can root into the soil and get moisture out of the soil as well as on the bark of a tree. And aeroids kind of hence the name, kind of grow out in the air a little bit. Uh, some of them will grow in trees, uh, kind of like the orchids, um, but, uh, but they're very versatile plants. A lot of them are vining plants, um, and they're just very tough, durable plants. And that makes them one of the easier plants to grow. Also, let's think about where they grow. They grow in tropical climates, typically, at least a lot of the varieties that I'm gonna show you today. Um, and they grow underneath trees, which means most of them do pretty well with medium to low light, which makes it very versatile to use in your home where you might not have a lot of bright light. Now, some do like a little bit more bright light. All plants really would like a little bit more sunlight, um, but let's think about where these plants are growing. They're growing in these tropical rainforests. They're down on the floor. They're growing up in trees, on, on trees, you know, around trees as vines. Um, and so they're reaching for light, but they're getting mostly dapple sunlight, but it's a bright area. So, you know, you think about walking through a, a forest area, you know, you're not going to get a ton of bright light, uh, but you will get 
uh, some spots, some dapple, bright light uh, that they're reaching for and that they're searching for. And you'll see that in some of the leaf structures as I show you, uh, what they're trying to do and what they're trying to reach out and grab as much sunlight as they possibly can. And so in your home, I kind of always kind of say, you know, you know, the home is, every home is different. And I always am kind of saying, you know, the, the, the best sun that you're going to get is in a south facing window. You're going to get the most amount of light. However, if you've got a tree outside your window, then you're going to get more dapple light. So even though I say it's a south facing window and then you should be getting super, super bright light, and that would be maybe too much light for some of these plants, it might not be because you might have an obstruction out there like a tree that's shading your home, uh, which works well for you. But for the light system for you know, the, the trees uh, or for the plants inside your home, then uh, you might want to consider all of the different options out there. East is going to get the morning sun, which is going to be great for majority of these plants. West is going to get some afternoon sun, which might be really, really bright if you don't have no trees outside. Um, but it might not be quite as bright if you bring them a little bit more into the interior of your home. So you might have a room that has a west facing window, uh, but inside the room a little bit further in, you're not going to get as much light, but it'll be good light for some of these plants. So always kind of thinking about the light situation uh, for plants and then watering. So aeroids are one of those great plants uh, that, that, you know, typically you're not going to grow a lot of these in water. We do recommend, especially if they're growing in a soil, which a potting soil, a media of some sort, um, that you're going to purchase it from us, hopefully, uh, wherever you get your plant from, is usually going to be growing in some sort of media. And so to take it from that media and to grow it in straight water uh, is kind of a big shock to go one way or the other. So I typically say keep it in the same environment that it's in. If it's in a more uh, a peat moss or mossy kind of mix that's holding more moisture, try and keep that going throughout its lifespan. Uh, but any type of growing media, an all-purpose potting soil, professional potting soil, is what you're probably going to want to grow these in. Um, so let's see, is there anything else that I can think of? Sorry, my phone's going off. <laughs> Uh, I usually put it on silent, forgot to it today. Um, so let's see, is there anything else that, uh, uh, let's see, they also grow in, so as I was talking about the tropical area, the rainforest type of, of situation that is growing in, humidity. Humidity is a huge part of these plants. Because they have these aerial roots, these aeroid roots, um, they're looking for moisture everywhere. They're trying to grab it. A lot of them are growing on trees, and so they're getting moisture as it comes down the bark. They're sending their root system into soil nearby, into nooks and crannies, into anything that has uh, some sort of, of capacity to hold water. Um, it could be a clump of leaves in a nook. Uh, even some of these aeroids will grow root systems that even actually grow outwards a little bit to catch some debris, to create a little bit more of a condition where they can get some moisture from. But they don't need a lot. And that's what I think really makes these great indoor plants is because they can live in a small pot for many, many years. They love to be root bound, uh, which makes them for me a very easy plant to grow. Um, they also can help with people that maybe are a little bit heavier with watering or a little bit lighter with watering. They're pretty versatile. And we'll go through some of the watering requirements as we go along. Um, another cool feature of uh, the aeroid family is their bloom. It's actually a lot of blooms on one thing and it's called a spadix. And so let's see if I can grab a good example here for you. Let's go with a common one, the anthurium. So this is, of course, a very common bloom that a lot of us know. This is a gorgeous plant. Anthuriums are awesome. They're easy to grow. Um, but anthuriums, this is the spadix, this whole structure. It's actually the inflorescence. So it's, I, you can call it a bloom. That's what I call it. These are the anthurium blooms. But it's actually um, an inflorescence. And what that means is here on this spadix here, on this, on this kind of the, the main kind of spike here in the center, um, this is where all the blooms are held. And so actually there's hundreds, could be thousands, depending on how big the spadix is, um, of blooms on this one little uh, inflorescence. And this outer covering, what we consider the color or the, the bloom is what we might call it, this is actually the spathe. This is actually a leaf-like structure. It's very similar, usually going to be a very similar looking leaf, a lot of times similar color. So a lot of times in your spadix, the spathe is going to be very similar color to the plant itself. It's going to be kind of a green color. Uh, however, with anthuriums, peace lilies a lot of times are white. Uh, could be on that, on that, that lighter lime green side. But what's really cool is this has tons of blooms all over it. 
and there's male and female blooms on a lot of them. And what that means is the insects that are attracted to these spadix uh, will actually get onto the, the, the basically the inflorescence here and will transfer pollen from the female down to the male and then that's how it can seed and reproduce. That's why all plants bloom, is to reproduce. And so some obviously are going to bloom a little bit heavier, are gonna put out their spadix a little bit more, uh, like anthuriums. That's a, that's a great example of one that kind of is consistently doing it. You can see this one here, and then we got another one, and then we got two more coming over here. So anthuriums are a great example of that. Let's see, do I have, let's see if I got some more examples here. I've got this peace lily here. So again, you can see the blooms, that inflorescence, and real close, you can see that little kind of thing in there, and that's all those little things that are kind of those little tiny little nodes or notches in the inflorescence are actually the bloom, and that's where the pollen is coming out of. A lot of these have a, a fragrance to them. Now, most of them are not really grown for their blooms. Um, so anthuriums and peace lilies would be a, a, an example of, of plants, of, of aeroids that we grow for the inflorescence, for the bloom, uh, and they don't have fragrance. But there are some out there that do have a really pungent fragrance. Um, and you might get some blooms here and there. You're probably not growing them for the blooms. Most of them you're growing for the leaves. Uh, but that is another common feature of an aeroid is the inflorescence. The bloom is that spade, spadix with a spathe kind of covering it to kind of protect it a little bit. Um, so th those are some, uh, some kind of uh, the, the, the uh, characteristics of aeroids. Uh, let's see, anything else? I mean, extremely diverse look in the leaf color, in the leaf shape, in the structure, in the, in the, in the habit uh, of the leaves, uh, which is why they're so collectible right now. Uh, because they offer a lot, a lot of different colors, a lot of different shapes, um, and just really add a lot of different looks to your home. Of course, the Monstera, the Philodendron Monstera, is one of the most popular right now. Let's see if I can grab this big one over here. So you can see that really cool leaf structure that's got these slits cut into it. That's natural, that's exactly how it grows. And I'll explain a little bit when I get to this specific plant why it does that. Let me get that out of the way. And I'm surrounded by plants. I got a lot to show you. So once I kind of get through some of this, this minor detail, we'll just do kind of a show and tell portion where I will show you all of these different options out there. Um, all right, so let's see what else. I talked about light a little bit. So overall, they prefer, prefer morning light. Um, and some can handle higher light, and some actually might require higher light. Um, and, and we'll kind of go through those as I kind of go through each plant. If there's something specific, I'll tell you. In general, with dealing with any plant inside your home, everybody's homes are gonna offer different conditions. Every plant that you're gonna buy as an indoor plant has been typically grown in a greenhouse, and so bringing them from a greenhouse to your home, there's gonna be a little bit of a shock period. I always tell people, don't be concerned. It's gonna go through a little bit of a, of, of a, you know, kind of figuring out its new home situation. So it's gonna go through a little bit of a, of a phase there where it, it might not be performing like you maybe had hoped. Give it some time. It could be as little as one to two weeks. It could be as, as much as two to three months. So give it some time and try it in the right location. Once you have it in the right location, I say keep it there. However, I will also say, Taking your plants outside for a summer vacation is a great option. Uh, you get a little bit more humidity, um, especially here in our area. I see Judy is from Scottsdale, Arizona, so a little less humidity there. Um, but I can help with that. I'll talk about that here in a second. Um, so, so think about the, the areas in your home that you wanna do. When you come in, ask questions. If you're looking for a specific plant, if you have your heart set on a specific plant, the nice thing about these aeroids is they're pretty versatile and you really can usually find one for every nook and cranny in your home. Um, I know my collection is growing um, as well as I'm sure a lot of yours are as well. Um, okay, so watering, we'll touch on that real quick. Uh, the, the watering part of this is pretty simple. Uh, you don't wanna let them get bone dry, um, but you don't want, so a wet dry cycle is okay um, if we're not going to the extreme of dry. So like let's say a succulent, uh, a cactus or something like that where we're really letting it get dry before we water it again. With 
your uh, air roids you're typically watering and then when the top one to two inches get dry then you might water again and that's kind of what, what we would recommend now to tell you by week how much you'll be watering uh once you know twice a month one once every week once every two weeks very difficult for me to be able to tell you because there's a lot of variables even in your home uh you know is it near a, a vent is it a warm room is it a cool room cooler rooms are going to stay a little bit moisture longer is it near the bathroom? Is it in the kitchen where you get a little bit more humidity in the air? Um, is your home more humid? Is your home more dry? There's lots and lots of different conditions that can cause your plants to dry out in different intervals. And so what I typically recommend with watering is don't get on a uh, pattern where it's like every week I water all my plants. That's typically not how plants are going to, and typically plants aren't going to enjoy that. Now we have a greenhouse here. We could almost probably get away with watering every day or every other day. Um, and that's fine because our greenhouse is gonna warm up. It gets lots and lots of natural light, but inside the home, you're not gonna get as much of that. You don't have the variables and the factors that you get outside, such as wind and evaporation. So always kind of just watch your plants, do as, as, as the plant is asking. So if the plant is staying more moist longer, then definitely don't water as much. And then, you know, and a lot of these plants can be as little as once a month or once every, or twice a month. It's very, very, very variable as to what you might have to do with your plants. So just kind of keep an eye on them. We do have this great tool here. And if you don't live in our area, you can probably find these anywhere. Uh, this is made by uh, Moser Lee Soil Masters. This is a pH, light, and moisture meter. Obviously pH is not a huge issue because potting soils are pretty much right in that kind of, uh, you know, seven, six six to seven frame, which is perfect for most of these plants. Uh, but what's really great about this little meter is it's a light and moisture meter. And so it'll tell you if it's dry, so it goes dry, moist, wet. So having it in that moist range is good. You don't want it to be too, too wet. Of course, it's gonna be wet right after you water it. Um, and then dry, of course, is, is probably getting too far to the extreme for most of your aeroids. It's also got a light meter on it, so it'll tell you if it's dark or light. So like right now it's facing me, it's dark. When I turn it to the window, it goes to light. So this is a great moisture and light meter. And then of course you get the added addition of a pH meter. So these are always a great thing. You can just take it, stick it into the soil, into your potting soil, and it'll tell you how the plant is doing. So obviously that, that really does help. Water, let's talk about water for just a second. Water is very important. Um, what type of water we use on aeroids um, is kind of important. I don't need you to, you don't need to go out and buy water. If you can collect rainwater, rainwater is of course the best. You know, I always say mother nature didn't intend to have plants inside our homes. Um, they're all intended to be outside and rainwater is like the best thing you can possibly give these plants. However, you can grow them in your home, that's perfectly fine. If you can catch rainwater, that's great. If you can't, then what I recommend is letting your water sit out for about 24 hours. It doesn't have to be 100% 24 hours. You know, if, if you remember, you know, one night I gotta water my plants, I usually say, wait one more day. Most of your plants can take it. Um, so fill up your watering cans, let it sit for about 24 hours, and then that will help it dechlorinate and get some of the additives that we put in there that we have to, fluoride and stuff like that, uh, that help make our water drinking water. But for plants, those things can become, you know, pretty, you know, harsh on the plant over time. Uh, so if your plants are super, super stressed out, let's say you were on vacation or you were gone or you just forgot to water and they need water, give them the water. It's not gonna hurt them. But every once in a while, or, you know, I, I try really hard to fill up my watering cans. Maybe when you're done watering, fill them up, let it sit there. If it sits there for a month, it's fine. It's still water. Um, so that's fine. If you can collect rainwater, that's great as well. But dechlorinating your water is a great option. You don't need to filter it. You don't need to buy, uh, you know, uh, spring water. You don't need to do anything like that. Uh, but what you want to do is just kind of let it sit and that helps kind of evaporate some of that stuff out of there. Um, humidity. Humidity is a great thing to have. All of these plants grow in the tropical rainforest, a lot of them at least, um, and so they're used to a little bit more of a humid situation. How do you get humidity in your home? Well, you can buy a humidifier. If you're really getting into plant collecting, it might be a good option. Uh, but what you can also do is mist the leaves. So we, have, we sell a lot of these little misters. They're very easy to come and grab. Uh, you can even get a bigger spray bottle if you want to, but misting the leaves will help add humidity. Having plants kind of grouped together also helps add humidity. 
you know, some of your plants are going to be, like I mentioned earlier, if we're not on a watering schedule, some of your plants are going to have some moisture in the soil that's going to be slowly building a little bit of a humid situation as well. Um, so that will help. Um, and so having plants kind of grouped together does add a little bit more humidity into that area. And then of course, one of my favorite options is making a humidity tray, which is super, super simple. This is just a plastic, clear plastic saucer. This is a little bit of a heavier duty one. Uh, you can use a clay pot saucer. You can use any saucer that you want, but basically what you would do is just fill this with a layer of rock and then fill it with water. And that water is gonna help kind of keep a humid situation in that area. Now it's not gonna make the whole room humid, but right there underneath the plant, it's fine. Now what you don't wanna do is have your plant sitting in the saucer and then have moisture sitting down here because then the root system can actually absorb that or the potting soil can actually absorb that moisture up into the, into the soil and then keep your plants wet too long. So if you've let a plant dry out too much, I know I did the other day with my Swiss cheese philodendron. And so what I did was I watered it really, really well. I let it sit in a saucer of water for about an hour or two, and then I pulled it out. So that way it was able to absorb a lot of that uh, water. It's also very root bound, which I find to be good. Um, I, you know, and another thing that we can talk about is, is, is how much or how big the pot that we go into. That's very, very important. Um, but typically having a humidity tray is a very, very good option. Just don't let your plants sit in water. Make sure any pot that you're growing in has drainage holes. That's very important. A lot of aeroids are going to send out these root systems outside, uh, which is pretty common. A lot of them, not all of them, uh, but a majority of them will do this. Uh, you know, pothos, for example, will grow on a trellis and send out some little air roots. Uh, but of course the philodendrons, a lot of them have these big air roots that kind of come out. Um, Let's see, was there something else? I think there was something else I was gonna mention there. Um, I think I got it all. All right, so then feeding our plants. Well, let me see, I've got a question here from Michelle. My pot, this is sitting inside another pot, but the original pot has a cord coming from it which draws the water from the outside pot. Should I get rid of it? Um, no, I don't think that's probably a problem. If, if it's a, a wicking system, that's, that's pretty good. Um, now, if it's something like, um, like an African violet pot, something, African violet pots are usually a clay-based pot too, so it's hard to understand if that's a, if that's a wick, because wicks will sometimes just constantly wick moisture in, whereas a lot of like your watering maids, I don't think I have one handy, um, or we've got these plant saver little guys that are clay spike, and so clay, uh, the spike itself, when it's sitting around dry soil, uh, will open up its pores and allow moisture to come out. And then as that soil gets wet, the clay spike becomes wet, and then the pores close and doesn't allow any more moisture out. So it doesn't water consistently, but a wick sometimes will. And so sometimes those self-watering pots will keep on drawing moisture in. That might be too much for the pothos. Check your soil, got a great tool right here in your finger. Check your soil, if it's never drying out, then that might be the issue is that we're getting too much moisture in there. So try that. Um, I feel like there was something else I was going to mention on, on the watering portion, but I can't remember. I'm sure I'll think of it here in a little bit. But misting helps. Humidity tray, if you want to go as far as getting a humidifier, that helps as well. Uh, water when the top one to two inches dry out is kind of a general rule of thumb. Now there are some other variables in there. We'll talk about them as we get going here uh, when I start to show you all the plants. For example, peace lilies. I think a lot of us have grown peace lilies. We know that they'll dry out a little bit more. I'll pull this one up here. The nice thing about peace lilies is that they um, will tell you if they need to be watered. And sometimes letting them go that far is not a bad option. You might not get as many blooms if you're pushing a little bit more. Uh, they are a little bit of a heavy feeder uh, because that will help them bloom. And a little bit more light helps them bloom. I, I know I have one in a pretty shady room. It doesn't bloom much and it looks great. And we typically let it go to the point where it starts to hang a little bit and then we soak it real good. But the plant itself looks great. Of course, if we got blooms, they would be awesome. And typically they bloom a little bit heavier in that spring summer time frame than they do in the winter, which is what we're still in. Um, oh, so then the last thing was plant food. I think that's what I was thinking about trying to mention next. Um, when, to, when to feed our aeroids, kind of is again, variable as to what the plant needs. I know Michelle, you were mentioning your leaves turning yellow earlier. It might need some nutrients. Um, I think that's kind of one thing that we, that we probably as a, as a group, I know I do, I tend to forget, um, I tend to forget using uh, a, a food, a, at a somewhat consistent rate. Uh, but typically all of our indoor plants would like to be fed during the growing season, which is spring, summer, and then maybe again in the fall. So, you know, doing 
three, four applications. Now, if we're going liquid, so like I was showing earlier, this Schultz liquid plant food is a great one. There's a lot of different uh, liquid foods out there. They're not gonna be quite as heavy. They're not gonna last as long. They're gonna wash through the soil and the media and down through the root system pretty quickly. Um, but then you can get granular fertilizers like our green leaf um, or Osmocote. There's a lot of different options. Uh, Espoma's got a lot of good ones too. We've got organic as well. So you got our organic green leaf as well. So these are great options as a slow release fertilizer that's gonna slowly feed over a two to three month time frame. So something like this, I could feed every, you know, you know, every three months, every two to three months, um, and then it's gonna continue to feed and it's gonna be slow release and it's got a good source of nitrogen, which is what a lot of these plants want. Uh, let's see, does misting cause mildew? Uh, not typically, not unless you're, we're over misting. So I don't recommend doing it every single day. I usually do mine probably once a week. I uh, just go through and mist down the leaves a little bit. Um, I do try and, again, group my plants together. I think that really helps. And a humidity tray is awesome. Uh, but if you're in a very dry room um, and, or if, uh, you, if you see an issue where it just doesn't seem to be performing really, really well, you can try the mist really, really does help kind of revive the plant a little bit. You can also consider, uh, I always show this product, it's one of my favorites. This is Super Thrive. It's a little four ounce bottle. It's a concentrated vitamin supplement. This is a great thing for plants that might be struggling. So Michelle, I didn't think about this for you, but sometimes when we don't know what the plant is going through and it's just stressed for some reason uh, and we need to kind of get it out of its funk, then I always recommend Super Thrive. It's a really, really great vitamin supplement, vitamin solution. Uh, it's really, really, it kind of looks hokey because it says, you know, 1940s World's Fair's gold medal winner, but it really is awesome. People, they use this a lot when they're transplanting big plants uh, that they're worried about stressing out or overstressing. Bonsai growers use this a lot for bonsai plants because they're kind of stressed out plants. Just takes the stress off gets the plant going again, and it's not a complete total food, but what it is is a vitamin supplement kind of gets it, the plant rejuvenated. So this is kind of one of my go-to ones for that. All right, um, so let's see. I think that kind of covers everything. We talked about water, we talked about light. I'm gonna go into those a little bit more detail as I get into the plants. I got a lot of plants here, so I wanna kind of get rolling on this to show you all the different plants that we have. Of course, if you live in our neck of the woods, come and check out this collection. We've got a huge collection. It's growing and getting better and better every week. Um, and of course, aeroids are one of my favorite uh, plants to grow inside uh, because they thrive on you know, the, creating their own root system and they don't need a lot of soil. I don't think I mentioned that earlier. They don't really need a lot of soil. Think about how these plants, you know, if you do a little bit of research or you ask us a couple questions about the plant and you find out what its natural home is, being able to emulate that is the best way to grow a lot of these plants. All right, let's get rolling on. Philodendrons is where I wanna start. Philodendrons is a huge group of plants. Um, as I showed you earlier, the split leaf philodendron, uh, the monstera, here's a smaller one. So we've got lots and lots of different sizes of all these different plants, but this guy has become super, super popular because of that form of the leaf with those slits inside. The philodendron monstera is awesome. Uh, what I do find with these, so bigger leaves typically are plants that are trying to capture as much light as possible. And why do they have these slits in there? Well, it's kind of not really known, um, but probably what it is, what we think, we believe, is why they're doing these slits in the leaves, is they're trying to cover as much surface area, so they're trying to reach out and grab as much light as possible. Let me get this big one out. So this guy is growing in the tropical rainforest and trying to find as much light as it possibly can. And so you can see this leaf, it's reaching out, but instead of forming a solid leaf, it's put all these slits in it. And so what that's doing is it's able to reach out and grab as much light as it possibly can, but it's not having to put a ton of effort into it. So it's being very efficient. It's saying, I'm gonna get out there and reach out and try and get as much light, but I don't need a whole solid leaf to do that. Uh, yes, will I miss some light here and there, but overall my surface area is greater than even this leaf right here that only has one slit. So this took a lot more energy into producing this leaf than it did this leaf because it's got these holes. So that is one theory. We're not 100% sure, we can't talk to plants, but that seems to be most likely is the bigger the leaf, the bigger, the more sun they're trying to get. So think about that as well when you're inside your home. But this Monstera is great, easy to care for. It sends out great aerial roots, these big aeroid roots coming out. Um, I know my daughter has a six inch plant that we got, I think 
last year, maybe at our at our show. Um, and so it's got big air roots coming out. We did grow it outside this summer just to kind of get it going. Brought it back in during this winter, keep it in a nice warm spot, uh, and it gets a lot of bright light in the afternoon. And so that's typically what these plants are looking for. They're trying to find the light, so give it some light. So even though these can grow pretty well in low light too, so these are very variable plants. They can grow in a lot of different conditions. Uh, you know, think again, this is growing in the rainforest, um, and so therefore it, uh, it, it can, it's, it, it's getting dapple sunlight, but it's bright light. Um, so if you're inside your home and it's low light, a lot of times in a low light situation, you might not see as much of this dissected leaf. You might see smaller leaves and you also might see it kind of sprawling out a little bit more. Um, and that's kind of indicative of it growing in a low light condition. Doesn't mean that it's hurt. And if you like it and it's doing well, then it's fine. Completely fine. Uh, so we say, when do you repot a monstera? That's a great question. Um, move this big guy off to the side. So repotting monsteras um, and really any kind of aeroid is really only recommended uh, when you've got a pretty tight root system. Let me see if I can find one in here that I've got that's got a lot of roots. I don't know if I have one. Let's just check this one out since we're talking about monsteras. A great way to tell is to give your pot a little squeeze. If, especially if it's in a grower pot, which I will typically say if you're getting a new plant, keep it in the grower pot for a while. Let's not add a new stress to it. It's going to a new home. Let's let it get acclimated before we move it into a, a slightly bigger pot if that's what our desire is. Uh, or into just a very similar size pot that might be um, a ceramic pot or a clair, uh, terracotta pot. Uh, but you can give a, if it's a plastic pot, give it a little squeeze. If it feels pretty tight, it might need uh, to be uh, repotted. You can also just gently pull it out and look. So here you can see a fair amount of roots, but not a ton, not enough to say, okay, I got to repot this. Remember, indoor plants love, for the most part, love to be root bound. And aeroids especially don't need a lot of soil to grow in. Um, so these are vines, you know, they're, they're latching onto trees, they're trying to grow upright uh, and trying to, you know, find different areas and pockets of moisture and they're doing everything on their own. So they don't 100% need a ton of soil. So what I typically tell Mariana, what I would tell you is, uh, Marina, sorry, uh, what I would tell you is uh, wait till it's very, very root bound before you repot it. And then just slightly grade up. So I don't want to take this and go into a big pot. So typically one to two inches bigger is about the biggest I would go with it. And then watch your watering, don't overwater it. When you've got excess soil surrounding a root system, uh, and you've got it inside your home, then um, that water, that, that moisture, that, that soil can stay moist for too long. And so therefore you can cause root rot issues. And that's one of the most common issues with most of our indoor plants. I know that was what I did the first time I ever grew indoor plants. I put them all in big, huge pots. I said, these plants are gonna get huge. This is gonna be great, killed them all. So they like to be root bound, keep them a little bit root bound. If you're gonna repot it, let's say going into like fall or winter, you might even hold off another whole season to get it to the spring or summer because then if we're worried about it kind of getting too wet or too moist or that soil capacity is too much, we can always take it outside and that'll help allow it dry out a little bit quicker. Um, so they like being evenly moist. They don't like being overly watered. However, some can take it because that's kind of where they come from. Some, but not all. So I like to kind of group them all into saying, you know, water, Water it well, let it the top one to two inches dry out, and then water it again. Try not to get on a schedule. Water it using the finger test, checking with your soil with your finger, or using a moisture meter. All right, so that's philodendron monstera. Very, very popular, awesome, awesome plant. And they can get pretty big. They can take up some space. So think about that kind of option as well as, as what you're growing, uh, how much space you might have. Philodendron, Swiss cheese philodendron, really, really popular. You can see this kind of big one behind me growing on this post. So lots and lots of different ways to grow this. I love the trailing feature, uh, growing these on a, on a bookcase so that it can trail down. You can grow them in hanging baskets so they can trail down. Or you can grow them in a pot with just a big wood stake. You can use bamboo, you can use a moss pole, you can use a big wooden stake like this. And just, you want to get it started on there. So you want to tie it to it to get it started. I don't know if you can quite see these ties right here. But this is just tied to this wooden stake. And then all these aerial roots are gonna to start to come out. I can start to see all these little nodes 
in here. And those are aerial roots and they're gonna to start to come out and they'll all get tangled up and that's great. That's what they wanna do. Um, and that's kind of how they're gonna climb. You can see it even on this guy right here. So you can see these little aerial roots coming down right here. Hence the name aeroids. So Swiss cheese philodendron is a really, really good one. This one also would prefer a little bit brighter light. Um, again, think about the leaf structure. So why is it doing the split leaf? It's trying to find as much light source as it possibly can without putting a ton of energy into it. So if you've got it in a low light situation and it's not doing, doing, it's not doing really, really well, then you might move it to a little bit of brighter situation. Uh, what can you do if you happen to overwater it? Um, that's a great question right now because it's the winter time. Uh, it's difficult. What I would do is move it, if you can, to a, a warmer room. If you've got a warmer room, that will help dry it out a little bit quicker. Um, I would never say put it near a heat vent or something like that. Let it just dry out. I mean, let it go, a, you know, pretty, pretty dry. If we think we've overwatered it, that's about the best option you can, you can have is to just not water it until it dries out. Um, so I would try that. If it was in the summer time frame, even if we were in the spring, if the temperatures were above, uh, let's say 60 degrees, then I might say take it outside. Uh, let it sit outside for a little while and that'll help dry it out for sure. Now, if we get a warm day, like yesterday was pretty nice. I don't know where uh, your uh, location is, uh, but if you're in the area uh, and we get a nice warm day, you can take it outside for you know a few hours and that might help it dry out as well. Uh, but really the best solution is to just let it dry out, not water it for a while, let it get really, really dry. That'll help kind of get that moisture out of there and then you can water it again. And you might even push it a little bit and go past that one to two inches drying out. Let it really get kind of dry before we water it again. All right, let's see, what's the next one on my list? So we did the Monstera, we did the Swiss cheese. So we got the Brazil, which is this. So this is a pretty common one. So this is a philodendron. More of the vining philodendron is very similar to a pothos look. A very, very easy plant to grow. This one likes medium to bright light. Um, wet dry cycle, you know, letting the top dry out a little bit. Um, so this is a great option. Love that variegation. Love that, that chartreuse lime green. Very similar to another very common philodendron, which is the cordatum, which is just your green. So very similar plants, just a variegated with a lime green color on the inside. Love that color. And then of course, just that dark green with those lime green new growth leaves. So really, really pretty plants, great indoor plants, great for beginners, uh, medium to high light. Uh, these, do, do, these do very well. Um, in fact, the darker the green, so this is a great point to kind of make now, the darker the green, usually the less light it actually needs. So this one actually do, does pretty well, low light to medium light. The variegated, you're going to get better variegation if you get a little bit more light on this. So medium to bright light on this guy. Uh, let's see, Luann said, if you take a house plant outside for a vacation, do you need to be concerned about bringing insect pests back in when you bring it indoors when vacation is over? Pests like white flies. For sure, uh, Luann, there's, there's a lot of issues obviously that can occur when you take a plant outside, bring it back in. A majority of those issues are actually in the soil. Um, so a lot of those insects will go down into the soil. You know, it's a nice, light, easy media. There's a lot of organic matter in there that they're gonna enjoy. Um, and they'll lay eggs. And then when you bring it inside, it's winter time frame, but it's warm inside your house, they'll hatch. And then you've got all these different bugs. A lot of them are gonna be your mealy bugs, your aphids. Aphids are probably one of the biggest issues. Um, white fly can be one. Uh, so there's a couple different, most of them aren't hard insects to get rid of scale. Uh, I've got a lot of different solutions that you can use. Uh, neem oil is probably one of my favorites because it's very, very safe. It's organic, it's completely natural. Neem oil works uh, in a suffocation, you know, as a, suff as a suffocant. So basically you're spraying the plant with an oil, it's gonna suffocate any of the insects. It actually works on some of the diseases as well because it suffocates them and prevents them or causes them to die. Now it might take multiple sprays to really get them because you gotta actually suffocate, you gotta cover the plant, you gotta cover the insect in this oil to suffocate it out. So neem oil is a good option. Uh, I always say have a bottle of triple action around Triple action is one of my favorites uh, because if you don't know what it is, it's an insecticide, fungicide, and miticide, neem oil, and pyrethrin, and pyrethrin comes from the chrysanthemum flower, so it's basically organic. Um, and so it's a very, very good solution to use because chrysanthemum oil will kill the insect on contact and the neem oil will suffocate anything else. There's a couple other you know, traditional options. 
which I do love in uh, situations where maybe it's a, a little bit of a more intense kind of infestation and I got to get rid of them. But the systemic insect granulars are good. So as long as you're not eating your plant, this is a good option. It's safe to use on plants that, you know, we're not, you know, you know uh, having pollen for the, the bees and the butterflies. Uh, but other than that, just a greenery plant like a lot of these are. You can sprinkle this in. It's just a granular. You just sprinkle it right on the top surface. It's great for indoor plants. Um, now, of course, if you have pets and stuff like that, be careful. Keep your plant kind of quarantined until you can uh, let this kind of dissolve and work its way into the root system. And then it goes into the root system and lasts for about six to eight weeks. So this is a good one. And then, of course, this is one of my favorites. This is our indoor-outdoor insect spray. So this is a multi-purpose insect spray. It's basically permethrin, so it's a traditional method, but it's an aerosol. And aerosols are great because they can get in all the little nooks and crannies. You know, think about all those little areas that, that insects can hide in. And so I'll usually take this into my garage, spray down the plant real good, let it sit for a while, and then bring it back inside. So the indoor-outdoor insect spray, and this is made by Fertilome. Sorry, I know it's kind of blurring in and out but this is a really really good option it's inexpensive it goes a long way it's an aerosol so it gets into a lot of those nooks and crannies so hopefully that helps luann and that kind of helps because now i kind of tidied up all the insect issues uh, that you might uh, uh, have on some of your plants and how to cure them those are kind of my go-to solutions all right let's keep rolling let's i just want to show you all of these now uh, and i'll try and pick up the pace a little bit burly max this is another philodendron. That's really, really cool. Kind of these long, narrow leaves. So again, you can see just all the different types of leaf uh, structures and leaf habits that these can have. This is Burley Max. This is another philodendron. Really kind of cool habit. Really different. Lots of aerial roots that are going to start coming out of here. Uh, let's see. What's next? We've got Gigantium. Let me see if I can get this guy. This guy's pretty big. Look at this guy, Woo. huge leaves. So this is gig Philodendron Gigantium. Let's see if I can get this kind of spun around. So these won't get those uh, cuts in the leaves like our Monsteras. Um, they might get some here and there, but pretty irregular to get that. Uh, but just look at that leaf. I mean, it's a huge leaf. Kind of looks like an elephant ear, which by the way, Alocasia is also an aeroid. But this is a really cool plant. We've got a gorgeous one and you can just see all those air roots, all the aeroid roots right there coming out. So isn't that interesting? I just love seeing all those roots spilling out. We have a nice one planted up in a big pot here. It's got just tons of these roots coming out. This is Philodendron Gigantium. Move that one off to the side. Let's see, we've also got, this is a really pretty one. Uh, this one is called Birkin. So Philodendron Birkin. I just love the variegated leaves. These are really cool. These just came in. So that's a really nice looking philodendron. You can see that variegation in the leaf. Uh, let's see, Birkin likes medium to bright light and Gigantium bright light as well. Bigger the leaf, the more they're trying to capture. Variegation, more light typically. So the uh, Birkin is uh, medium to bright light. Let's see, the Rojo Congo. Love the color on this. Look at that dark. Kind of looks like a rubber plant, uh, but this is that dark green leaf. Love the undersides of the leaves. The stems are kind of this really pretty purple color, this dark purple. I don't know if you can see that real well. And then the leaves are just awesome. This just looks exotic to me, and I just love the different color. Uh, you know, greens are so popular right now, and all the different types of greens out there are just amazing, but this one is just awesome. Kind of even has a little bit of that salmon kind of color you can see kind of right there on the edge. But this is Rojo Congo Philodendron. This is a bright light, big leaf, bright light. Um, let's see, what's next? Shangri-La, I've got that one right here. So you can see the different leaf structure again. I love these, these are so cool. So Shangri-La, and it's got these dissected leaves, which kind of have all these lobes to them almost. Um, just a different look, different leaf structure, and that's kind of what people are after these days, is just different looks in the leaves. And so this is a really cool one. We just got these in as well. Um, so this one is Shangri-La, medium to bright light. Put that back. Let's see, we got Moonlight, which was one of my favorites. When I first started working here, I've been here almost 17, uh, over 17 years now. Um, and this was just one that always kind of caught my attention. Uh, it's called Moonlight Philodendron. Uh, they like medium to bright light. 
Got a bigger size leaf. It's very similar to the Rojo Congo as far as the structure and the habit of the plant, but I just love, I love chartreuse green. I just love that kind of lime green color. And then of course you get this kind of like burgundy kind of salmon colored spathe that comes out here, the leaf covering. So you can see that in the new leaves, sometimes will even emerge with a little bit of burgundy color in them as well. But I just love, I just love that coloration in the, in the leaves. I just think it's a really cool one. Uh, so that's moonlight, medium to bright light. Revolutions, okay, I'm gonna see if I can get this guy. So I've been showing you this root system the whole time. You're probably wondering what plant this is coming from. This is the only one we have. Uh, it's a revolutions uh, is what the variety is and it is massive, it's huge. So let me see if I can get this down and see if I can even fit it in the camera. So look at these air roots right here first. Love these, just huge air roots. So this is growing in a hanging basket. This is a cedar basket basically with some openings in it. You see a lot of times uh, ferns planted in this. It's got a moss kind of filler to allow the soil to stay in. It might be planted totally in moss. Uh, but then look at these leaves. Let me bring this down without you know, hurting any of the can you see me still? <laughs> so look at that leaf. I mean, just a gorgeous, dissected, big, huge green leaf. Really cool. So revolutions, let's see if we can guess how much light this wants. Medium to bright light, of course. It's trying to find the light. So this is a huge one. It kind of reminds me of that one that I just showed you. Let me get this back up on my hook. So it kind of reminds me of the Shangri-La as far as the dissected leaf look, um, but just really, really cool. And that one's just huge, uh, pretty rare, pretty hard to find those. Uh, and that is a special one, of course. Um, so I just wanted to bring it in here. I know I only have one, uh, so hopefully somebody will come and, and give it a great home. Um, but that one is just spectacular, amazing. Um, and then the Tetrasperma. So this is kind of the last philodendron that I got. Where'd I put it? It's down here. These have been really, really popular as well. Um, so these only need about medium light. You don't need to put, you don't really want to put these in a super, super bright window. You don't want to go too low light, kind of right in the mid range on the light uh, scale, but you can see they will get these really cool leaves, leaves on there. Let's see if I can turn this so you can see it. Just a very unusual, we've got some big ones in pots that are growing up on a trellis. So it's a vine, of course. Uh, really, really sought after, uh, so a little bit on the rarer side, um, so, but these are really, really cool philodendrons. Tetrasperma. All right, so that kind of covers the philodendrons. Now let's talk about pothos. Pothos kind of was always my go-to. If it wasn't uh, the Cordata philodendron, this guy, then it was probably pothos that I was always go-to. Look at those. I mean, they almost look identical. But pothos, a little bit more of, I guess you could say, a little bit more of a pointed leaf, not as, I mean, they're pretty similar leaves, heart-shaped leaves. I mean, you can almost not tell the difference, but philodendron's gonna have a little bit more of a tougher kind of leathery leaf, whereas this one's gonna be a little bit more of a waxy leaf. But pothos are great low light to medium light plants. Uh, they can actually take a lot of anything. You can grow these in low to bright light. They're pretty tough, indestructible plants. Pothos are kind of my go-to uh, for if you're a first plant buyer. I love them because of the trailing habit. So you can grow them in hanging baskets on the top of a bookcase in a, in a planter and let it trail all the way down. You know, you can run these around. I saw a video the other day of it going up a, I can't remember if it was a school or what it was, but it was growing all the way up the staircase of a school, I think in New York City. So really, really versatile plant, very, very easy to grow. This one is called Jade. So this is just your green pothos, bright lime green, new leaves, really, really easy. My favorite, favorite plant, one of my favorites is the pothos, the neon pothos. I've got lots of favorites. So you're gonna hear me say that a lot. My favorite plant, I've got lots, but neon pothos is awesome. I will actually use this a lot in containers uh, in the you know, spring, early summer, when I'm planting up a big container to go outside. These are just great. Kind of reminds you of that sweet potato vine, uh, but this one I can always dig up and bring back inside and kind of replant uh, for the winter season. I can use them year after year if I want to, but these are really pretty. Neon pothos, very easy to grow. Uh, let's see, what else do I have? I've got the, I love this one too. This is silver satin, just a kind of a different leaf. You almost don't even think it's, 
uh, Apothos. You're gonna see a lot of this in like the Diffenbachias when I get to the Diffenbachias. They're really cool. So this one's called Silver Satin. Kind of almost has a silvered kind of raised area in the leaf. Kind of a cool variegation. Uh, you see it in the Silver Queen. Where's my Silver Queen? I thought I brought one. Oh, right next to me. So there you go. There's, sorry, this is, make sure I get my variety right so I can tell you. Yep, so this one's Marble Queen. Sorry. So we've got Silver Satin and Marble Queen. So you can kind of see the slight difference. This is more of a white variegation. Really pretty pothos. And then we've got the Silver Satin. So you can kind of see the difference there. And then, of course, last but not least is the very traditional, the very common, the Golden Pothos. Another classic. You know, I, I know my grandmother probably had one of these. Everybody's grandmother probably had one. They are super, super easy. Um, golden Pothos, a lot of times in hanging baskets. Very affordable, very easy to grow. Uh, really, really pretty plant. Just love that dapple of that gold color in there. So Golden Pothos. So we roll through the pothos pretty quick because it's, a, it's not a huge group. They're all pretty similar. They're all vining plants. I didn't grab one. We actually have some growing on like big uh, poles, kind of like this uh, Swiss cheese philodendron. So pothos can grow on a trellis or a pole. It's very easy to do that as well. Let it hang down out of a hanging basket in a pot. You can run it across a kitchen, you know, cabinetry or something. Lots and lots of versatility and pothos are so versatile. Low light to bright light. Uh, let's see. The next is the anthurium. I showed you that one earlier, so anthuriums are awesome, very easy to grow, medium to bright light, a little bit of a bigger leaf, so they're looking for a little bit more light, medium to bright light, um, and then of course, they're heavy feeders, they're, they're producing a lot of blooms, and so they need a little bit more energy to do that, so I like to use the green leaf plant food on these, keep some blooming, uh, but anthuriums are great, and you actually can find lots of different colors now in that bloom, the spadix. Uh, and that spathe color, you can get burgundies and even some whites and some different colors, pinks, and then of course the most common red. This is actually a pink one. Um, I know it might not be showing up on that on the camera, but you can get that really dark red, really, really popular, kind of that heart shape, great for Valentine's Day. I know you missed it, but it's a great one for Valentine's Day. And then the other anthurium is this bigger one. This one's called hooker eye. So this one is not grown for its blooms necessarily. It's grown more for its foliage. It's a very tough, durable, leathery foliage. It's really kind of cool. I just find it very modern looking. Comes all from that kind of central point right there. Um, but just a really, really cool looking anthurium. Very, very tough. Um, I don't think I had any other notes. Uh, very hardy, rippled leaves, low to bright light. So it's a very versatile anthurium. Really, really tough. Kind of reminds me of a cast iron plant. Uh, because it's just very tough and very durable. Uh, but really cool anthurium, grown more for its foliage than obviously for its blooms. So those are my anthuriums. Let's go to aglaonemia. So this is a really, really great one. Great group of plants. Uh, aglaonemias are Chinese evergreens, is another common name for them. But aglaonemia tends to be kind of the term that's catching on now, which is great. Uh, lots and lots of marbling and different colors in the leaves. Um, Aglaonemia are, are easy to grow. Uh, they tolerate very low light. Uh, so if you've got a really low light situation, they can tolerate it. Uh, what I typically tell people is the pinks and the whites need medium light. So if you've got more, so let's show you the pinks and the whites, then those are gonna need a little bit more on the medium light side. Um, if you've got the gray colors, like this guy right here, so see that, more of that gray? This can take very, very low light. So if you got a really low light situation and you're looking for a pretty plant with a little bit of variegation in it, then this would be a great option. So think gray and greens, low light, pinks and whites, brighter light. A little bit easy way to kind of remember that. But this one's called Narrow Spinel. It's got that red dappling. It's a little red, little pink. When it's held up to the light, you can see the pink. See a little bit of that white underside. The white one that I was showing you is called Dalmatian. Really pretty leaves. Aglaonemias are just very, very common, very, very easy to grow. And I won't say super common, so like this one is Katrina. A little bit of a harder one to find. It's got, it's hard to see on the camera, but it's got this faint kind of pink coloration in there. Really cool one. 
This one I love. This one is called Golden Floret. I just love it because of it's, it's like this dark green blotch here. We've got this really dark green leaf coming out. It's got these little pink, these pink hued stems to it. So I don't know if you can quite see that, but it's got a little bit of pink in it. It's got this pink kind of vein right down through the middle. Sometimes it explodes out a little bit more. Look at that leaf. And they'll kind of change as they get older. I just love that look with that leaf, with that like dark green splotch. I just love irregularities, I guess you could say, in leaves. I think that's really, really cool looking. Uh, so that one's called Golden Floret. This one is Silver Bay. I showed you that one earlier. This one can take very, very low light. Very easy plant to grow. Uh, let's see, do I have another one? Yeah, I think this one. So this is BJ Freeman. So again, another nice low light plant. So if you're looking for a bigger plant, a little bit bigger, a little bit beefier. Um, so if you're looking for a good low light plant, this is a really cool one, BJ Freeman. And let's see, I think this goes into my different bacchias. Yep, so then I'm into my different bacchias, which are very similar to aglonemias. Uh, different bacchias like a little bit more light. So if you're looking for the kind of like a low light situation, look at your aglonemias. If you're looking for a brighter light, then you might go with the different bacchias, which is what we're gonna start with next. Uh, medium to bright light, uh, they need a little bit more water than the rest of these aeroids. So uh, as I mentioned, kind of the peace lily thing, we'll get to peace lilies here in a second. I've got just that one, I'll kind of explain that a little bit to you. But different bacchias kind of fall into that same group. So you wanna keep them pretty evenly moist. Uh, we don't wanna let them get too dry. So I usually say let the top surface dry out and then give it a little bit of water. So we wanna try and keep it evenly moist. So for you out there that might be a little bit heavier with watering, this might be a better plan for you, peace lilies and different bacchia. This is one right here, this is called Camille. Look at that variegation in there. I mean, just almost a pure white center to the leaf with this really kind of cool dappling green on the outside working to a solid green on the edge. Really, really nice looking Diffenbachia, Camille. Really popular one. This one is very similar, this is called Compacta. A little bit more dappling, not quite a solid white on the inside. So you can see the two differences there. When you start to see these, you might be thinking caladiums. Caladiums are an aeroid. We don't have them yet, we'll get them. You know, those actually take a little bit longer to get them in plant form. We'll probably have those actually with leaves out, typically in the May time frame, mid to early May, hopefully. Uh, but we will get uh, bulbs in in about two weeks. I think we'll have caladium bulbs. So uh, really good option there. But these are not caladiums, different bacchios. Camille with that pure white center and then compacta. This is probably my favorite different bacchia, the camouflage. Look at that guy. A lot of people think actually that leaves do this to camouflage themselves and to throw off herbivores out there that might be eating the leaves of plants. Um, but camouflage is really cool. Again, I just love the irregularity in these leaves. Look at that guy. I mean, so cool. Just, I mean, every leaf is different. No leaf is the same. I absolutely love it. I love the splotches and the variegation in there. Camouflage. So different bacchia camouflage. And let's see, did I have another one? I thought I did. Maybe I didn't. I thought I had a smaller different bacchia. And that's kind of the thing is these all, we carry all these plants in so many different sizes. Uh, of course, some of the rarer species we'll have in mostly, you know, one size pot, whatever we can get our hands on. Uh, but some of these like aglonemias, different bacchias, we can get them all the way from a four inch. So like, that's not the, that's the next group. So like the little four inch aglonemia there. So you can get this little tiny pot if you got a little planter, windowsill type of planter, all the way up to this five gallon here, right here. So a 10 inch planter or a four inch planter. So again, you can get lots and lots of different sizes as well with these. All right, so the next group is peace lilies. Uh, so I kind of like to pair those with different bacchia to talk about the watering requirements. The nice thing about peace lilies is they show you when they need to be watered. It's a very common plant. I had one of these when I was in college. Trust me, I neglected it. Um, it was huge. I don't think I ever watered it until it looked like it was almost dead and then I watered it and it came perched right back up. Uh, so peace lilies are very easy to grow. Strap-like foliage, really nice glossy kind of color. Uh, so it's a really, really sharp looking plant. And then of course the white blooms, which are just really stand out with that dark green foliage. 
Peace lilies, if you're trying to grow a new plant and you might be a heavier waterer, peace lilies might be a good option for you. Especially for us that are just beginning out growing house plants. I wish somebody had told me that. Get a peace lily because you can't kill it. If you water it a little bit too much, it'll be fine. It'll like it. Uh, so then the next one is ZZ plant. So look at that guy. Very modern foliage. Really cool looking. ZZ because it's got all these kind of like really like Z-shaped kind of structure leaves here that kind of create this kind of really in and out look. Really, really cool looking, glossy, very, very tough plant. Extremely low light situation. So these don't need a whole lot of, 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 of light. However, they can take pretty bright light too. So if you just love the habit and you don't really know what kind of light you have, ZZ plant is a go-to. It's almost becoming one of my new favorites kind of as a go-to first person plant. So if you're a plant parent and you don't have a plant yet and you're trying to become a plant parent, this is a great option. ZZ plants are really cool, structurally kind of modern looking um, and just have this great kind of glossy green leaf to them. Really, really cool looking plants. Very easy to grow. Wet dry cycle. You can let these dry out pretty much, you know, to a very dry point and then water them again. Again, I always try with my aeroids to keep them all on that same kind of general one to two inches dry on the top surface and then water them again. Except for my peace lilies and Diffenbachias, I ramp up the watering a little bit. ZZ plants, you could actually kind of go a little bit less. So great for people that maybe have a vacation home or in an office where it might sit for a while. Uh, really, really good option. ZZ plant, very, very versatile. Can take really anything you throw at it. It's one of my best kind of go-to beginner plants, but also just fun to grow because it's one of those that you can kind of neglect and it thrives on it. All right, uh, let's see. Next is the alocasia or, um, or calocasia. Uh, so basically elephant ears. You're gonna see that when I bring out this plant, like that elephant ear. So this one is called, I can't remember the name on this one, uh, is Regal Shield. So you can see that really dark green color. I mean, almost black with that light colored vein. So it really stands out. And then of course that classic elephant ear shape. Now this is gonna be a little bit more upright. It's gonna hold its leaves up a little bit more. You can see this guy's inflorescence here. So let me pull this around so you can see this guy. Really cool. I mean, not really again grown for its blooms. I, I wouldn't say this is a pretty bloom, but it really shows off that inflorescence. And if I can get it close enough, you can see the top of that spate, that spadix, that kind of that corn looking thing is going to be the flowers. And then underneath that is going to be the male flowers. Um, in fact, if I open up, I don't know if I can open that up. Yeah, because that's the spathe. So if we look at that again, there's the spadix and that's the spathe right there. And then this is just kind of where the seeds are. So again, they're attracting insects and different things to cross pollinate right there on the same inflorescence. Really, really cool looking, which is very unusual. Look, let me see if I can get that real close. So just different looking, and that's very common with aeroids. But again, grown more for the foliage. If you didn't like the bloom, you can easily go and cut it off. I usually let it go through its blooming process a little bit. You can see a new one coming right there. Look at that guy. So that one hasn't even opened yet. Really cool. Oh, so I guess the screen froze uh, when I was talking about the peace lily. Peace lilies are easy, water them. Um, if you got a heavier hand in watering, water them really well. Uh, it does require a little bit more light, so these can grow in low light to bright light. A little bit more light will help it bloom. Giving it a liquid or a granular fertilizer every so often will also help with its blooming. Really, I grow up more for the foliage um, because it's very, very easy. It's that glossy green leaf. If you're looking for more blooms, and you're not getting them, you might try a little bit brighter light situation. But the cool thing about them is you can water them to the point where uh, you, know, you, you think you're overwatering it, but they can really take a fair amount of water. So if you're a heavier hand at watering, this is a great option. If you're not, it'll tell you. It'll kind of droop down and hang, and then you just water it and it perks right back up. All right, so the elephant ears, lots and lots of different options out there. Coming soon, even more options. This one's called Regal Shield. Really pretty with that dark green foliage. This is the only other one that I have right now. This one is called White Lava. Let's see if you can see that. Look at that. So this actually gets better with a little bit more light. Of course, it's winter time. Uh, this is grown in our greenhouse. You can grow these actually as great indoor plants, 
but you've got this white kind of vein. The white lava part of this actually will get more intense as we get a little bit longer days. Um, and then of course, elephant ears, I think a lot of us, uh, us know them as bulbs. Uh, we carry them as bulbs and we'll have those hopefully in about two or three weeks, uh, maybe sooner. Um, so you can plant those once we're kind of in that, you know, mid to late March time frame is a, is a great time to plant them. Most of the bulbs that we carry are going to be uh, winter hardy, which means you can just leave them in the ground. They come back year after year, get bigger and bigger. Outside, plant these in the shade. Uh, inside, they can take a little bit of sun outside, but I usually see that they do a little bit better in a little bit of shade. Inside, bright light. Why bright light? Because they got these big leaves and they're looking for that bright light. Um, so really, really cool and more to come. We carry lots and lots of different elephant ears, the black ones, white lava, the mojito. There's lots and lots of different options. We'll have them all season long, starting in houseplants, carrying them in bulbs, and then we'll get them outside in our perennial section as well. And that is a very common aeroid that grows in our area. Um, so let's see, Wendy said, are these elephant ears the same thing that can be grown outside in the ground? So that I will have to check on you. That's actually something I was thinking. I think so because Regal Shield and White Lava, I've sold as bulbs before, I believe. Uh, but I'll need to check some. We got to check on the zones for the elephant ears uh, because some of them don't quite come up as far as our zones. Seven, eight is usually what we're in. So Wendy, check your zones um, and I'll get back to you on if these two can actually be planted outside. Uh, my black, so Autumn said, my black elephant ear plant is super sad and the leaves start to wilt before they even get big. They usually stay smaller than my hand. Is that normal for this time of year? So Autumn, I'm assuming you have it inside. Check a couple things. Make sure you don't have it in too much potting soil uh, would be one thing. Um, and then move it to a little bit of a brighter light situation. That will also help. You don't want it sitting in a ton of soil. Uh, and that might be helpful. So yeah, yours is indoors. Um, they also, you wanna get them as much warmth as they possibly can have. You know, think of them as a perennial outside. They're not gonna come up out of the ground for probably another, you know, two months. Uh, you know, maybe into April, late April before they come out of the ground. So it's still kind of cold for them. The days are short. Uh, so having a little bit more sunlight would probably help. Um, and then make sure that it's not sitting in too much soil and getting too, too wet. Uh, however, elephant ears can take a little bit more moisture. Um, I doubt it's the water. It's probably not enough light, maybe not enough warmth. Check those two things. Hopefully that helps, Autumn. Um, let's see. So then uh, the next one is, I'm going to butcher this name. I know I am. All right, Syngonium. 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 There we go. I'd get it eventually. Syngonium uh, is a kind of cool, a lot of people call it arrowhead vine. Uh, so you can see kind of that arrowhead shape. This one's really neat with this kind of, as the leaves get older, they kind of start to turn into this green color. But as the leaves emerge, they're more in this burgundy color. So really pretty kind of multicolored vine, arrowhead vine, syngonium. This is a really, really cool one. Let's see. Um, Please, what was the name of the beginner plant that can withstand no watering in an office? So ZZ plant. I won't say no watering. You want to give it some water, Regina, uh, but it's a go-to plant uh, for beginners out there. Really, really easy. This is what it looks like, ZZ plant. So if you get into your office maybe once or twice a week at this time of year uh, with, with everything that's going on, uh, this would be a great one. You would probably typically only water this, you know, as much as maybe once a month, maybe twice a month depending on the location, depending on the light, but it can take low light to bright light. Super, super easy ZZ plant, very tough. Uh, let's see, I see a couple other questions rolling in. So let's see, um, how do you plant something in a lot of soil? What does that mean? Okay, so uh, uh, I guess kind of what I'm explaining is, is I don't wanna ever take a small plant. So I don't wanna take this little guy and put it in a big soil pot. So for the uh, elephant ear, uh, the, the person asking about the elephant ear, um, then if sometimes if, if we've got it in too much soil, meaning it's a, it's a bulb and it's got roots, and then if it's got a lot of soil around it, then that can mean it's staying too wet. And root rot issues are kind of a sign of, of small leaves or drooping, uh, not performing very, very well. And that's what I mean uh, by too much soil. I don't wanna take this little plant and put it in a bunch of soil. Soil inside our home with no evaporation, not a lot of sunlight, not a lot of wind, 
uh, they're not going to dry out very quickly. So hopefully that helps answer that question, uh, Wendy, when I say, so, so Wendy was answering the question, a pot too big for the plant, exactly. So if I take a small plant, put it in a big pot, too much soil. Uh, all right, so let's see, I've got a couple more to get to before we kind of wrap this up. Um, can you identify what's pet friendly and what, what's not as you go? Uh, Christine, I would love to, um, but I don't know that actually. Uh, there's so many different plants here and there's a lot of different information out there. What I always tell people, and I'm probably gonna mess this up, but maybe somebody listening uh, will help answer this question. I can never remember, but I think there's a website, I think it's the AARS, uh, I think is, is right. Uh, so basically it's a, uh, uh, a society uh, uh, that deals with pets. So if you've got dogs or cats and you're worried about toxicity levels, uh, check that website out. There's so many different levels of toxicity. So it's very hard for me to answer that question on every single plant. Um, the ASPCA has a list, thank you. So the ASPCA um, is a great option to be able to go there and you can type in any type of plant and it'll give you whether it's toxic. Now pretty much every plant out there is gonna be toxic to some level. Um, so always you know, be, be mindful of that. If it says that it's gonna cause death, then obviously you don't want that plant. Uh, but if it kind of mild stomach, stomach uh, pain, stuff like that, uh, then keep those plants away from your pets as much as you possibly can. But typically, most of these plants, pets aren't gonna mess with. If they don't like to eat them, they're not gonna eat them. Uh, but be careful, of course, check out that site. Uh, it's always kind of my go-to ASPCA website. It gives you all the lists, or if you just type into their search engine, the name of the plant, so you could type in Diffenbachia, you could type in uh, Aglaonemia, you could type in Chinese Evergreen, you can type in anything you want, and it'll tell you the toxicity. All right, a couple more plants that we'll get to uh, is the calla lily. So you wanna talk about a spadex? There you go, that is your spadex right there. So really kind of great example. Calla lilies are a perennial bulb in this area. You can plant them in the uh, spring, and they'll bloom in the summertime frame, but you can also grow them indoors. They're great indoor plants. Um, you know, pretty good light, pretty bright light inside. This is your spadex here. So now we can really see this one's obviously grown for its blooms, for its inflorescence. But if you look inside, you're gonna see that little corn looking thing. And then as the blooms get older and older, older then you can see that little bloom coming out, the inflorescence really coming out. And that's got full, you know, loaded with pollen. It's got two different little sections. You're always gonna see that on the spadex of male and female flowers, and that's how you get the pollination. And insects are attracted to the color, the smell, uh, whatever it might be, and then they'll climb up and down and spread that pollen and help pollinate it. So really, really cool. So if you're trying to grow them for seed or, you know, not that that's super easy to do and you're not gonna get a lot of blooms on a lot of these plants, a lot of them are grown for greenery. You can actually take like a watercolor brush, like a paint brush, and just move the pollen up and down that, that stamen, basically, that inflorescence and transfer the pollen and then you'll get seeds off of it. If it stays long enough and all things go right. Hard to do. I'm not a propagation expert, um, so a lot of these, you know, uh, uh, you know, trying to get these plants to get to a seed uh, uh, position is very, very difficult. But just a great looking calla lily. Oh, and I forgot this little guy, this little alocasia. Look at that guy. These are really, really popular. This one's called alocasia poly. So you can just see that great variegation. So another elephant ear, completely different look, waxy leaf. This one I know you can only grow inside, uh, but that's kind of a cool one. All right, and then other ones that are coming, uh, we'll get some philodendron xanadus soon. Uh, we'll get the Salome Hope, uh, caladiums, as I mentioned, and then lots and lots of uh, different varieties of elephant ears as we get warmer. And then, of course, we're always trying to get more collections. Uh, you know, these are such cool plants. Aeroids are just awesome. Uh, it's a huge group. Like I mentioned, over 3,500 different species out there. Uh, so there's just so many. We don't offer them all, of course, uh, but they're very, very versatile plants. They're very tough plants. All of them make great indoor plants. Uh, finding the right situation is, is the best thing that you can do. Uh, let's see, Wendy said, what is the best way to pinch or prune back the vines to maintain size? I pinched a pothos once and it produced a flood of clear liquid for over 24 hours from the cut stem. Yuck. Yes, Wendy, these do, their sap is clear on pretty much all aeroids. Uh, I won't say all of them, but a, a majority of them, a lot of times if you water them, they'll actually kind of sap out of the tips of the leaves 
Um, that's kind of common. But yes, if you pinch them, it is going to get, uh, it's going to leak its sap. It's kind of like we would do bleeding. If whenever we cut anything, it's going to bleed a little bit. Uh, and then it'll, it'll heal up. Uh, so that is the best thing I can tell you is just kind of let it heal. Uh, sometimes if it's, if it's hanging, so if you got the pothos, and we got a long trailing vine coming out of it, we're gonna cut it down here, then yes, it's gonna drip from there. What you can sometimes do is take your vine and bring it back up so that it doesn't drip onto your floor. Uh, you could put it in the sink for, it could take 24 hours, you're probably right. Uh, usually it happens in about 12 to 18 hours, it'll seal up. Could happen in as little as you know 15 minutes to 60 minutes. You could find that that, that, that uh, cut has sealed up, but yes, Doing a little bit of a fresh cut on it or, or a tip cut uh, is a great way to kind of bush out your plants, uh, especially on your vining plants, your pothos, your Swiss cheese philodendron. You can take cuts and that'll help kind of bush it out. So if it's getting kind of viney and kind of gangly and you need to kind of prune it back a little bit, maybe to control it, but also to help kind of fill it out, then that is a great option. I would recommend using a pair of pruners, bypass pruners would make a nice clean cut. Uh, so pinching kind of sometimes crushes the stem. So if I take my hands and I pinch it out you can kind of kind of like an anvil pruner used to do it will crush the stem and that'll open up more areas for infection, but also harder for it to heal up a nice bypass pruner is just a pair of scissors. Even uh, will make a nice clean cut and it's a little bit easier for it to heal from that. Uh, but yes, pruning them is definitely an option. Uh, even on your bigger philodendron, so like your monsteras as that vine starts to grow, you can take and cut that back if you need to, to allow it to grow back out a little bit more. Um, and then most of your other plants like Chinese evergreens, anthuriums, that grow kind of from a central point, usually what you're doing is just cutting back or cutting off old leaves. That's a great practice to do. Um, as your leaves begin to fade, it's putting in a lot of energy to try and keep that leaf alive. So if that leaf is old and it's going and you've got tons of new leaves, go ahead and cut that leaf off because all it's doing is spending energy trying to put all its energy into an old leaf. Let's see, I think I just had a good example of that. So here's my pothos, my golden pothos. And as you can see, these old leaves down here, they're starting to get a little ratty. You know, that could have happened in shipping, but it could just be also that they're old. So I can go in, I prefer to do this with pruners, but I'll do it with my fingers right now. And see that leaf, it's putting energy into that leaf. So it's putting a lot of its resources to try and keep this leaf going. By taking it out, you're diverting its energy into the rest of the plant, allowing it to put out new leaves and new runners and new roots and everything. So by just going through every once in a while and inspecting your plants and doing a little bit of pruning helps. You can even see right here, I don't know if you can see this, but right here is where it has been pruned, right? So we got a little prune point right there. And then right here is a new shoot coming right off. So literally this was pruned probably at the grower right there. And then the new growth coming right off of it. Got another great, uh, even better example right here. Pruned right here. And then a new leaf, new vine shooting out right here. So just by doing a little bit of prune, <laughs> even more examples, they're just all over this guy. So you can see there pruned a new shoot coming out. So by pruning it back, get some new shoots, fills out, becomes much better, especially if it's getting a little leggy on you. All right, I went through all my plants. Aeroids are awesome. It's a great group of plants. You got wide range from low light, from the ZZ plant, um, all the way up to some bright light, like your philodendron monsteras or your Swiss cheese philodendrons. Um, lots and lots of different options. So you can find a place for any of them in your home. Uh, some that bloom, that have that really pretty spadix, that, that flower color, the spathe with the red color. Um, but we can call it a bloom. Um, and so there's lots and lots of pretty colors with your anthuriums, with your calla lilies, peace lilies will give you some bloom color. If you get blooms on any of your other plants, they're gonna be interesting for sure. Uh, they might not be as uh, exciting to see. You might not even see them, you might miss them, uh, but it's fun to see that. And when they're blooming, that means they're happy typically. Um, and so really, really fun plants to grow. It's a great group of plants really, really popular out there right now. So, you know, check out your philodendrons, all the different leaf habits, you know, your dissected leaves, your leaves that have holes in them, like the Swiss cheese philodendron, the um, philodendron monstera. Love philodendrons, they're becoming super, super popular. So much fun to grow these guys. Uh, and just lots and lots of choices out there. And the collection just gets bigger and bigger. So if you live in our neck of the woods, come in and check us out here at McDonald Garden Center. 
Um, in the next coming weeks, we'll be talking more and more about, uh, next week we're doing um, all on LED lights, on how to grow inside, not just LED, fluorescent bulbs as well. So we'll be able to cover the gamut on how to grow under lights inside your home. Um, and then we'll be taking a short little break and then we're gonna come back with our spring showcase, which we're super, super excited about. Uh, so join us for all of those. And then we'll continue this webinar series all the way through the spring. Spring is almost here. It's just around the corner. So we're really excited about that. Uh, thank you all for joining. I hope you all have a great day. If you've got any, any other questions, fire them away. Uh, if not, we'll be taking off. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.